Thanks for staying with us. It's time now to go to the press and see what headlines um, uh, made it to the front pages of the national dailies. Uh, this morning, we're being joined by Mr. Stephen Aguirre, the solicitor. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Good morning, sir. Mm. Okay, uh, let's start with the daily independence this morning. Uh, the leading headline there is, uh, anxiety grows among ministers as presidency confirms looming sack. Uh, the writers are saying, says federal government to use TED funds allocation to fund students' loans and uh, won't intervene in NNPCL Dangote refinery petrol price war. I uh, would like your take on that. Okay, that's the thing about the ministers. Hmm. Well, the, the, uh, it's overdue actually to review the work that has been done by this government and its ministers. And uh, we all remember that uh, this was a, a lingering problem under the last government. Uh, ministers appeared to serve the whole time, even when they were not performing. And there was no sort of sanction for poor performance and all that. So on one hand, you can say this is a welcome development in that a government after a year or so is now reviewing the performance of ministers and all that. But the problem is, what is the government's uh, uh, plans and objectives? Because you see, government is going to measure them against what it expects of them. And my worry is that what government wants of them, does it co coincide with what Nigerians want of them mm. you know so that's the uh, anxiety i have yes it is good to review the work of ministers after a period of time after one year or so um there's a lot of um, um misgiving towards government policy uh, the removal of subsidy as you have said before the increase of tariffs on uh, electricity, all the taxation measures and all that without a commensurate uh, um, things that uh, people can say, this is improving my well-being, you know. So it's good to review uh, performance of police. But as against what? As against the objective of government or the desires of the people? Mm. Having said that, there's no doubt about it. Many of the uh, ministers have just been ministers in name. We know some of them. We never, we never even heard of them. That's the truth be told. Uh, but the principal question still remains: What are you reviewing them against? Against the ex expectations of government policy or against what the people want? So that's my. That's yeah, my it's it's, it's a very it's a very uh, interesting question. What are the parameters? What are the indices uh, to indicate that you have uh, done well or you have not done well? The government, the presidency, mm -hmm. came out to say that um, the government is doing a lot. It's just that uh, people don't know about these things, and they it urged uh, the the ministers to publish whatever they are doing so that people get to know uh, that they are doing this. It's just like someone coming to you and asking you, do you know who I am? For as long as you ask that question, it means that you are not, you're not someone so significant that you should be known. It means that you're not doing something that people should know you about. So what are those things that they are doing that government is praising them, but saying that it's just that people are not seeing it? So that question that you asked will be a very interesting one. Uh, let them tell us what it is that they will be measuring them against. But under that same story, we, we saw that um, the federal government has said that they won't intervene in NNPCL Dangote refinery petrol price war. I don't know how you feel about that. I don't know. I don't know what that means because essentially petrol is the lifeblood of the economy. So if there's a price war between Dangote and the... Uh, and, uh, uh, NNPCL. Body. Mm. NNPC. I mean, you should be intervening because, I mean, we are talking about the life blood that runs the economy. The price of fuel affects everything and all that. And I, I don't know how government says it wants to start as a standard loaf and be taken as a, 
That's serious. In any case, the principal problem in that sector is that uh, what we are seeing is an imagined monopoly. Uh, but this was well known before, that uh, government was not repairing its own refineries or having a policy as to what to do with the refineries. Are we selling the refineries? Are we trying to resuscitate them? What government has been doing is continue to say, we will resuscitate the refineries without results, you know? And then you then have on one hand that go to refinery, which has been moving towards uh, production and which is very close to coming on stream. And then there's this battle between uh, uh, NNPC and um, NM, uh, and um, Dangote Refinery about price. And you say you are not going to intervene in that when you yourself have not set the proper conditions that remove the issue of uh, monopoly and all that. I mean, it, it seems, um, seems a little absurd. <laughs> Okay, uh, I just wonder what, what NNPCL is. Um, is NNPCL really a, pri a private company? Is it owned by the government? Uh, is it, why is it the one that is angling to become the, only, the sole uh, lifter of petrol from Dangote and all that? I don't even know the place of NNPCL in the scheme of things nowadays. And, and I'm sure a lot of Nigerians do not even understand what is going on. Why are they behaving the way they are behaving? Are they not supposed to be also a player like every other private uh, company is a player in the oil sector? So if they are owned by the government, why are they doing what they are doing? I just don't understand. I don't know whether you understand the place of NNPCL right now in the scheme of things. Well, NNPC is supposed to be a private uh, enterprise, so they claim. But then you have a private uh, enterprise whose major shareholders are said to be Nigerians. And who are the Nigerians? It's said to be us. But you know, anything that belongs to everybody, there must be somebody that exercises uh, powers of control and all that. And that is the government. So it, it boils down to the fact that the government still owns NNPC, even though you say you're giving shares outside. I mean, you and I cannot control what goes on in NNPC. So obviously, someone has to do it on our behalf. That's government. So it's like... Um, the game of ostrich that we are playing now, you put your head in the sand and you say, oh, you can't see me, but we can see you. It's still the government. So I don't know what they are talking about. Here. <laughs> it's, 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 it's crazy. Okay, let's take these two headlines um, together, if it is possible. Uh, still the same uh, uh, daily independence. Uh, on the uh, left corner there, you see, I'll punish judges who give unnecessary ex parte orders. That's according to the new uh, CJN. Uh, as uh, the Senate confirmed her yesterday, I think, uh, Kekere Kun has been confirmed as a new CJN. I'll punish judges who give unnecessary ex parte orders. And two, uh, two stories after that, or a story after that, uh, okay, two stories after that, you see, alleged money laundering caught at Jones to October 30 as Yaya Bello heads to Supreme Court. Uh, you are a solicitor. Let me, let me ask you this. It, it's funny. We hope that uh, Kekre Kun, even though a lot of people uh, have no confidence in her because of the judgment of Imo State uh, of the Hope uh, Uzodima, which she superintended over, uh, but um, now she has come up and talking tough, like we've always seen all of them that are appointed uh, talking tough. We hope that it, she will deliver. But this problem of Yaya Belu is what I really am interested in. Uh, I was asking earlier, is it just possible to walk from your house to the Supreme Court or are you supposed to go to the Supreme Court when all avenues have been exhausted in the lower courts and then you are still not satisfied? Yaya Belu just walked from his house after allegedly going to EFCC and was not arrested and then people coming out to protest uh, against EFCC for witch hunting him, uh, so to speak, and all that. And then he has gone out to the Supreme Court to make sure the warrant of arrest is upturned. How, how does that even okay. work? Okay, let, me, let me start with the first part of the career uh, justice, the Chief Justice of the Federation, yes. the career, talking about uh, ex parte injunctions. We are going around to a cycle. Is it, what worries me sometimes in this mission is that we seem to be going around a cycle. We go, we say this, we go around and we come a long journey and we come and say exactly the same thing. For since since I believe the time of justice wires hmm. as Chief Justice of the Federation, 
We have been talking about the fact that ex parte injunctions is by its very nature potentially illegal in that uh, the consumer provisions for fair hearing are being affected when you go where they, you see what happens when you get an expert injunction is that you are not serving the other party so you are going before the judge without the judge having benefit of what the other side is saying fundamentally that's a breach of our constitution so you shouldn't normally use it so that it, you should only use it in the highest exception when it is absolutely necessary and every responsible judge should first of all say look what is the issue here what's the urgency here why can't you serve the other party the assumption should always be the other party must be served mm -hmm. that that's the first thing you must serve the other party but if you now say oh there's some urgency somebody is about to die oh um, if we don't do this, this building will be broken down. That's a good reason. Now the judge will now say, "Okay, I give you, a I give you a, a temporary injunction so that you can you can put the other man on notice to come so that we can we can we can sit over this adjudicate over this matter." That's what it should be. This is what the wife said years ago. So today. Uh, uh, um, my the lodge, my lodge justice was since long gone, retired so many years ago. We are still talking about the same thing he spoke of then. You see, sometimes the then seems we are not serious. We are just going around in cycles. You know what? Just uh, uh, Chief Justice Shuk uh, Kikirio Eku is saying it's right, but it is what we have always been saying. So why why has it not happened? That's for one. Now, let's go to Yaya Bindu's uh, matter. What happened with Yaya Bindu is that he challenged the manner of service of his warrant of arrest. Um, the first, the high court judge ruled against it. He went to the court of appeal and challenged it again. The court of appeal ruled against it. Now he's at the Supreme Court. And because he has filed an appeal at the Supreme Court, he's asking the uh, high court to suspend action uh, on on uh, on the matter before the high court pending when the supreme court will do no it is not as if he has gone straight from the uh, high court straight to the supreme court there was an intermediate uh, procedure at the court of appeal which he lost for which he now appealed to the supreme court so that's what is going on with yaya well, at what point um does someone uh, answer for contempt of court or something. I, I, I don't know. I'm just trying to be educated right now. Yaya Bello has mm -hmm. been invited uh, peacefully, I may say, and uh, we've been seeing this hide and seek, hide and seek and all that, and he has still not appeared. The only time he may have been seen is that time they made a video. We don't know the circumstances uh, surrounding his appearance at EFCC uh, that they said EFCC did not uh, interrogate him, they did not arrest him, and then they laid siege at government house in Abuja trying to arrest him after that and all, all those kinds of things. But so at what point can a person be held and said, okay, you were invited and you didn't come by the court, you are uh, in contempt of court or something, at what point does it happen? Well, you see, the thing is that um, the processes of getting to where you wanted to get to are playing out in court right now. Um, he has an appeal that has to be dealt with. The problem is that it's not being, uh, it's our system, it's not working as fast as it should. All these matters should have been dealt with already so that you get to be sure why he will, he will not appear when he's uh, summoned and all that. But you saw the whole drama in the, uh, in, in the, uh, um, in the at the EFCC quarters here, other day and all that, and really one cannot know what was happening there. Uh, because if I am the EFCC chairman and uh, someone had been looking for arms before me, I would at least take a step and uh, 
not just look at him and all that, but we don't know what is going on there and all that. But in any case, uh, the judicial process should be allowed to play out. It's just that it's not, as usual, moving fast enough. The judiciary has its own challenges that no one ever addresses. Uh, they have the, the, the most of these courts are overloaded with cases, and uh, we need to sit down and uh, um, determine how we want to run our ju justice system in an expeditious manner. They have the same challenges that society has. Sometimes the generator doesn't work. Sometimes the, they have so many problems and all that. You, you go to court sometimes and find the generator is not working. Uh, one thing or the other is not working, just like anything else in the country. So that's, that's the issue. But um, well, let us watch the judicial process play out. He is a, at this point, he's a suspect. Mm -hmm. We lawyers always say that uh, um, in this kind of case, you should, uh, we should not assume that he is a criminal. We should first of all assume that he's innocent at this point in time and allow the judicial process to play out. It should play out very fast, but well, this is our system. This is our story. Mm. I'm, I'm just concerned. What, what is the reason for these challenges in the, in the judicial system? Is this the product of the government not doing the needful or what? Is it, because if there are so many cases, there also is a complaint that there are not enough judges to even uh, look at these cases. So whose fault is it? Is it that there are no people qualified enough or there's something else that is making us not to have enough judges that will be handling all these cases and making sure that they, are, they, are, they don't overclog the, um, the, the courts? Well, it's a systemic problem. Uh, in some places, okay, the Lagos that are more familiar with, actually what I got that needs to be done is we need to create more divisions of the Court of Appeal in Lagos. The one court that is here is completely overloaded. You need to create infrastructure for that. You need to build new a new uh, court for the court of appeal. You need to have because Lagos is very busy. You may need to have at least two or three more and uh, build infrastructure for them. Ensure generator works and uh, you know what it takes to run any institution today for the electricity and all that and all that. So. That's what I know in Lagos. It might be so in some other jurisdictions too. Um, so you, of course, you need more judges. That's a given. But it's not as if you can't get more judges. Uh, that you can always get more judges. But you need to build the infrastructure for that and all that. So those are some. Some of them are things that uh, um, administratively can be done better. But most of it is. Uh, really from governments. Uh, the challenges are, most of the challenges are from governments, not from the judiciary. When you say that. government, what, which government, state or federal? Oh, federal. 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 Because the cost of appeal is running, for instance, by federal. Mm -hmm. The state, the state uh, courts too have their own challenges. Again, the normal ones you have in society, sometimes the light goes off, sometimes the generator doesn't work, Sometimes, um, you know, maybe you need to digitalize more administratively. You need to um, embrace IT and use it more effectively and all that. Yes, those are there, but there are also those that involve government. See, in Lagos State government now, you see, since the Lagos High Court bond, there's a diversification of courts and all that, and that has helped. The Lagos State government, but in the case of Court of Appeal, we are talking of federal government, okay. not the state government. Okay. Um, now, uh, this story civil servants on daily trust. Now, civil servants go to work twice a week. Uh, that is a, a leading headline there. Um, the writers are saying even feeding is difficult. Only Lagos, Ogun, Oshun approve of days. And then there's also we pretend we don't know what's happening. That's according to one director. It will lead to low productivity, uh, according to analysts. We know that in some states, I think even more so, uh, even the schools 
have been asked to be coming to work only three times in a week. And I don't know how that is going to pan out. And I don't know how that is going to affect us as a country. Look, let us be honest. The situation we are in is unsustainable. You and I know it. Government knows it. The situation we are in in this country with the increase of oil prices, with the, with the with galloping inflation, is unsustainable. And some governments are realizing it. And uh, officially, what they are doing is approving truancy. Mm. Of course, there will not be productivity. But this is what they have to do in order to cope with an unsustainable situation that is actually crazy. The sooner government realizes that things are getting out of hand, the better. And, I mean, it's clear. That's what, that's what uh, civil servants and the uh, state governments and all that are responding to. Even the federal government is doing it. What kind of education are you going to get when children don't go to school uh, uh, five times a week? What kind of education are you getting? Oh, you, you are, are you not turning the country into a joke? I mean, these are obvious things. The situation we are in is clearly unsustainable. Mm -hmm. But if you say it, they think it's a partisan issue. It's not. Oh, well, the children I... going to... <laughs> I, I don't know. Sure. Uh, children, children are going to school three times a week. Uh, workers are going to work three times a week and all that. And even the three times a week that you're going to work or even two times, you, you may not even be able to afford it. For instance, in Lagos here, uh, there are people who, if the closer you stay to your workplace, the more rent maybe you pay. So people uh, tend to live as far as uh, the outskirts of Lagos because it is affordable to live in those places. And then to go to work from those places, you cannot even go. Uh, so for instance, you're working on the island and um, you want to get a ha house on the island, oh dear, you, you are going to pay through the nose and borrow money from your family and ancestors to pay just because you want to be close to your workplace. But if you live far, you cannot get to work. So I, I don't know where we're going I, to. I give, I give you an example. We spoke of the problems of the judiciary right now. The yes. state government says, Junior workers don't need to come to work five times a week. Mm -hmm. These junior workers include those in the judiciary. Mm -hmm. So if those junior workers are not coming, the judge has less staff to work with. Mm -hmm. How does that help productivity? It's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing. <laughs> We have not seen even the 100 buses that the governor, government pr promised. We have not seen the 40,000 Naira bag of rice. We have not seen the, uh, the uh, I mentioned these things earlier, the, um, the tax rebates or tax removal from importation of foodstuff and all those things that the government has promised. We are not even seeing them. And I don't know how, where we are going to. The same government is telling us, okay, right now, let's just say what Dangote said, that uh, fuel subsidy must be ended now. That is what he's calling on the government to do. The fuel subsidy that we were told has been removed. He's now advising them to remove it. I don't know whether they are re-removing what they had already removed. And then there's a projection that if that happens and it is totally removed, we might be buying fuel for as high as 1,800 Naira. I, <laughs> I don't know whether there will still be a Nigeria at that point. We are good at adjusting. Uh, no, no, no. It, there are some situations you can't really adjust to. Uh, for my small car, now, the, the other day, the foil was not uh, all gone. But I I ended up spending 40,000 naira to fill the tank. 40,000 naira. It wasn't, it wasn't zero. Then, okay, increase it by a factor of one eight. That's about double. That means I will be spending 80,000 to get the same results. Mm. I mean, so each time I walk to the feeding station, and you know, this for really, if I move around properly, then that takes me about a week to use. So it means every week I will be uh, foiling the car for 80,000 naira. How does that make sense? But the thing is, they keep telling you that in other countries it's even uh, costlier than in Nigeria. It's more expensive than in Nigeria. And I don't know whether what that is, is a good is, argument. What is the minimum wage in other countries? Mm. Good question. <laughs> Good question. What is the minimum wage of other countries? Okay, <laughs> let us move to the Punch newspaper. Um, 
the Punch newspaper is saying uh, Tinubu demands, we've talked about this cabinet reshuffle uh, in, other, in a, another newspaper. So let's take a small headline at, at bottom right corner. It's saying a dope poll marred by vote buying delay. That is according to uh, NBA observers. Uh, we've heard also the the uh, Yaga Africa said there were irregularities. So many CSOs came out and said that there were irregularities. One of the candidates said that it was a transaction. It's, it's expected anyway, but he said it was a transaction and not um, a, an election. And uh, we also saw a situation where there were like three or four governors of the ruling APC in a do state on election day. And I'm just asking myself, what were governors leaving their state to go and do in a do state and all that? But how would you rate the performance of INEC and the general uh, conduct of a, a do polls? Incidentally, I am from that state, and uh, all the reports I get is uh, that there was a um, last scale vote buying, um, even at the point of polling and all that and all of that. You see, what some of my people were saying was that, well, look, we couldn't resist it. Poverty has been weaponized. I mean, you have to take what they give you in a very tight economy like this. You cannot afford to be too... Uh, too Principled, noble. yeah. Yeah. So, you see, we, we, we need to... I don't know, we need to get back to... Uh, to... We need to get back to first base. Our democracy is not working as a democracy should, uh, where you find a situation where uh, money is what determines who is in power and it's done by both by Money always operates in an election. It's always a factor in an election. But when it is actual vote buying, then something is wrong with that kind of system. Because like, as you see, vote buying is also illegal. Um, we need to address those issues uh, you can we cannot even say that we look we see vote by and we look as cats we cannot look away from it what it means is that the, in itself that is an that is a, an irregularity in the system it needs to be dealt with one of in my view one of the problems that we have with our democracy actually is institutional that is the INEC itself has not proven itself to be a body worthy, worthy of doing what it was asked to do impartially. We still have to address that because that's what you see in the fallout where in every election ends up in court. The most minor elections end up in court, courts. This is not the same in other parts of the world. We should not accept what we normalize what is what does not hold everywhere. It is not a democratic norm that everybody goes to court after an election. Hmm. It's an anomaly. So from that point of view, you I think itself should be addressing itself. What are we doing wrong? Government itself should be looking at it. But we live in a, a nation where Things, have, things like this happen, we, we rationalize the abnormal and we move with that. But this is the reason why you see developmentally we are not doing well. You cannot do well if you normalize the absurd. Everybody knows what it is to get things right. So the institution of INEC itself is not working well. And it is having a deleterious effect on our democracy. And we would have to address that. Um, oh. Weaponization of poverty is a serious matter. It means, in essence, that you don't have a democracy. Hmm. That is where we are going. These are warning signs that our democracy is not working well. We need to pay attention to these problems. We 
cannot play a hostage with things like this. Our democracy is not working well. Uh, that means the words of uh, uh, former governor of Ekiti State, uh, Fire Oshie, stomach infrastructure is what is happening right now. They're building stomach, inf stomach infrastructure, and uh, if you do not support, then your, your infrastructure collapses. So that's what is happening. Uh, but every man uh, to himself or for himself, uh, God for all, as it were, um, so people are trying to venture into businesses since uh, it's very difficult to make ends meet. In fact, somebody was joking that in a country where you have two 1,000 Naira notes, two 500 Naira notes, two 200 Naira notes, two national anthems, you cannot survive with one job. You have to have at least two uh, that you, before you can sustain yourself. Now people are trying to do some business as either a side hustle or something that will sustain them uh, in this country. And then the CBN is raising uh, interest rate every MPS meeting that they have. They are raising uh, the rates. And some experts have come out, like in the Daily Trust this morning, we see somebody, the Fidelity Bank MD, saying MSMEs can't survive on current interest rate. Remember, it has been raised again to 27.25% as at the last uh, monetary committee meeting that they had. And the, the, the central bank governor is saying that because of this hike uh, in the rates, the Naira is now gaining the confidence of people. People are now confident in the Naira and uh, they know that it's doing well. What? <laughs> you see, that's what I'm saying about the objectives of governments. You, 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 you have to ask, if Nigeria is a patient, what is the objective of the doctor? Is it to maintain the hospital or to make sure the patient survives? Is it to ensure that the hospital is financially okay or that Nigeria, as the patient survives, and continues the Nigerian worker, the, that Nigerian continues to work and create more wealth. Mm. Or that, or you just want, if we, I use the analogy of the hospital, for the hospital to survive and the patient to be dead, mm. and then there will be nobody to create further wealth. This is the objective that, this, this is the conundrum that CBM must face. What is the point of economic policy? Is it to make sure your, my balance is okay? Or is it to make sure that my people are okay and can create new wealth? This is the issue that they must contend with. Because essentially, what is happening is that businesses are dying in Nigeria. Hmm. If businesses are dying, in the long run, how would you your, your the government balance sheet improve. That's the problem. Yeah. If, if, if I lend money at a certain interest rate and I project a 10% profit based on the interest rates I, I, I got it at, and the interest rate keeps shifting, and you know, many of these loans have a, a provision for interest review. And then the bank keeps increasing the interest on the loan I took that time. It obliterates my profits. I may have said 10% is my profit, but once interest rate keeps going there, it obliterates my profit. I go bankrupt. How does that help the economy? Uh, well, they, they, um, the foreign reserves have improved. Yeah, to, for to what end? <laughs> well. <laughs> to that, what end? That's what it. is the point of if economic activity comes to a halt, so you have a, you you will claim victory for one day, then your economy is going down. What is the point? Hmm. That, that's 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 what I keep asking. Well, what's the point? You must determine what's the point of my what is the point of governance? Is it to make my balance sheet look good so that I can tell IMF I'm okay, or? I run the economy, or economy so that it will continue to create wealth. Well, uh, the takeaway today is that uh, a very critical question you, you asked, uh, what are the parameters? What are 
What are they, the ministers, for instance, going to be judged on? What are the policies aimed at uh, achieving? Uh, because if the foreign reserves have uh, increased and so many other things uh, that they are seeing and we are not seeing are improving, uh, is that what you want or you want the interests of your people to be met? Uh, that's the critical question they have to ask themselves uh, this morning and beyond to know what they are really doing, whether it's for Nigerians or it's for just themselves. But <laughs> at this point, we'll have to wrap up, Mr. Agiode. Thank you so much for coming on the program this morning. My pleasure. Well, Mr. Aguirre is a solicitor. He was our guest this morning on uh, Off the Press. We were looking at headlines on some of the national dailies. We'll take a break now, and when we return, we'll be taking our first hot topic. Stay with us.